It's a pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Byron Reeves, who is the Paul Edwards Professor here at Stanford in Communication. And uh, his uh, primary research interest is in mass communication and uh, specifically understand the psychological effects that, uh, or aspects that go along with interactive media. And his work has actually influenced a range of products uh, for companies like Microsoft or IBM um, when it comes to uh, voice interfaces and, and automated uh, chatting systems. And his more, research, um, more recent uh, research interest is on how to use uh, interactive uh, kind of multiplayer uh, game technology to support learning as well as uh, CS work. And so that's, I think, what he's going to talk about today. So welcome. Yeah. So w one of the things that I've uh, noticed about a lot of the speakers is when, uh, this is a, an inference, I don't know it exactly, is that a lot of us got involved in games as kind of a second career, second job. Uh, my interest as a media psychologist was in primitive processing of emotional social responses, even some neuroscience. We do a lot of psychophysiology. I was always, for 35 years, I've been going around looking for the juiciest things in media that are interesting to uh, bring into the lab to, to look at how people respond to. So uh, it was about 10 years ago where we were borrowing a lot of pieces of games that I got interested in this. And when, when we started doing this, um, I could have never imagined that there would be a group like this and, and others this year, but uh, one that would be um, as interdisciplinary as you are, where I would be introduced by a biophysicist, <laughs> uh, somebody, what did you study? You studied zebrafish and, uh, and the biophysics of, uh, of, of animals and how they can, so thinking you know, that you're here uh, moderating this game uh, symposium is really pretty interesting um, to me, and, and I, I love that interdisciplinary character of what's going on. So it was a little over 10 years ago when we started getting interested in games as a genre. I'm not a media psychologist that's, that studies games. I study self-representation, reinforcement uh, or feedback systems, uh, emotional responses to primitive visual cues, and a whole list of stuff in, in, in the, among the colleagues that, that joined me in this. And one of the interesting things we always kept coming across is the most complex games at that time, this is the early 2000s, had all of that stuff. So we were game scholars, <laughs> uh, whether we liked it or not. This was a convenient place. We didn't have to look at erotic and pornography over here or advanced high definition displays over here or you know, whatever was the kind of the current piece of media that was of interest, we could, you could go to games and you could find uh, a lot of really interesting things to study. So one of the things that we started doing was finding the most complex versions of this form of media, the most popular form of media, bar none, more money, more people, uh, more investment uh, than television, film, so you know, you've probably all heard that. So um, one of the interesting things about this is when you start watching people do it. So I'm just, this is just, uh, let's see how loud this is. This is World of Warcraft. 35, 40 people on a raid trying to vanquish whatever the heck that thing is in the center there. It's often a dragon, something like that. But this, you just can't spend even 10 seconds, which you've done on this, and not say, geez, there's a lot going on there. These people are paying a lot of money per month for the privilege of analyzing data, constructing websites and spreadsheets, doing performance reviews, damage battle per second, and why, were, why didn't you... Uh, uh, heal the warriors a little better than you did in your you know, past uh, uh, role as a priest in the game. Just all kinds of stuff happening. And you just can't look at this, and, and this wasn't our, our primary, uh, primary thing we were trying to do, but you can't look at this and say, you know, gee whiz, why, why couldn't this be sales teams at Cisco competing against each other? <laughs> People who have these tools that they say are powerful and well-connected and, you know, done, they can do a lot of different things, but they're incredibly boring. 
they are not engaging at all. You know, the same things we're saying in the learning space and the scientific di discovery space. There's something going on here that causes people to spend the amount of time, have the investment they do, the emotional arousal, uh, and pay the money to actually do it. They're paying to go to work. They're paying to do things that are every bit as difficult as the, what they're doing in their jobs, I'm sure. So we noticed that. That wasn't our primary mission here. I was studying uh, arousal responses to self-representation via avatars and whether or not uh, your heart beat faster, accelerated or decelerated, if there was a story narrative context on the killing that was going, virtual killing that was going on in the game. Uh, and all those things were, were pieces of, and they were, I thought, really interesting psychological components. But we had to admit that this, and this was like 2008, so I'm doing a little history here. So uh, that World of Warcraft piece is like 04, 05, um, I think that one. But this was a picture of the hypothesis that we were developing in and around all the media psychology. That, you know, people go to work. Uh, they're bored. They don't know how they're doing. They're, doing, they're using tools that are dull uh, and repetitive. Uh, they have no idea how things are going. Are they contributing? Are they making a difference? Uh, and of course, this same guy in a different uh, uh, suit of armor at a different time of the day is getting all those things, playing on a team, knows exactly what's going on in the game. All that data popping up moment by moment, feedback occurring in really short uh, cycles as well as long cycles. I get to be represented by something that's more interesting and maybe better than myself, you know, this avatar. I've got virtual currency to trade. I've got all these different pieces of this game. So we started writing a few things that didn't have the psychophysiological signature of the avatar interaction in them. They had words and ideas about how to make this um, uh, useful in serious context. And in the context that we noticed first what, and wanted to talk about the most was work. Could we find a way for people to go to work inside of these games that was as rewarding or even half as re rewarding as the actual entertainment value that they were getting? So this was kind of 2008. We, that worked well. People were interested in that, wrote a book based on that article. Uh, looking at each of the pieces of these games and uh, early ideas about how you could represent almost all kinds of work. If you go to the federal government's uh, labor um, listing of all the different kinds of work you can have in the U.S., you can find virtually every category out of hundreds and hundreds of categories represented in these complex collaborative games. So people are learning, they're performing, they're building things, they're making things, they're doing discovery, um, they're organizing teams, they're building websites, they're doing all these wonderful things. So that was really kind of the promise. And that was the conversation in the business world also around 08, 09. We, we had uh, IBM was really interested in the ability of these games to um, develop leadership uh, uh, leadership in the games is different than at work. Uh, there's so many metrics available that uh, you don't have to be outgoing and good on the golf course to get the corner office. You've just got to have the better data. Uh, and so you get a lot of shy people that are advancing, and they were very, very interested in this. Uh, Cisco was very interested in virtual worlds and had uh, uh, a, one of their annual conferences represented in a virtual world. This is a uh, uh, Closer Wars was the name of this game, and they did have sales teams that were competing at this conference where people didn't have to fly to Rio and spend $10 million of the company's money to, to or $100 million, I think it was. It was $10 million on the game, <laughs> $100 million otherwise. I mean, you, when you get thousands of people doing all this, so they, they, they kind of like that, but a complex virtual environment. Um, Coding teams at a large insurance agency were trying to figure out, could we do this agile uh, programming, uh, collaborative programming, faster, better, if we were represented as these avatars in a virtual space, and here are all our projects, and everybody could see how things were going. So borrowing, stealing the best pieces of those games and dropping them in real work. So that's about 208. And then, about 209, this came along.
Now this is Farmville. <laughs> We're buying some seeds, getting some seeds, planting some crops. I don't have the audio on this one. Getting some crops, a little bit of chatting going on. Things are growing. We wait three hours, three days. We sell stuff. We get uh, data about how we're doing. We get some ribbons and acknowledgement and points. But this is not millions of dollars to produce, as World of Warcraft was. But this is initially, and I'm guessing I don't, I don't have access to hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, we always say, three guys, $300,000, three months, and you can have a Farmville type game. Well, that's interesting. So that, meant, that means that the barrier to actually trying this out, it's still significant, but it's not quite as high as thinking about World of Warcraft. Because one of the worries was maybe you really do have to build Warcraft or whatever other narrative you like, something that's really media rich before you can actually test this out. So this was really a big change in, in how people thought about the possibility of using games for social intervention and for the actual conduct of, of work. And it, it had, you know, we've got all these leaderboards now. We have points, we have badges and ribbons, and starting to, re, just like a cook, just starting to reduce the complexity of that World of Warcraft uh, interaction to essential components of the games. Maybe it's just seeing your name above and below somebody else's that motivates you to get going. Well, I want to be up there. How do you do that? Well, uh, do these things. Okay, I'm going to do those things. And if those things are valuable in the organization that's sponsoring this, then, then you'll, you'll get some value here. But the interesting thing to us was that a lot of the conversation now is reducing this, you know, relaxing all the media requirements here. So a lot of people becoming interested in this. It made it possible to start doing some of the learning games, I think, as well. Uh, a couple gamers could say, you know, I'm tired of just working for eyeballs. I want to try to help people. Let's build something that, that you know, let's build something this month that actually uh, help, helps them uh, um, do, do something they want to do. So in the business world, then you had uh, a company like Bunchball, um, and Rajat Paharia, uh, a, a former student here at Stanford, sat in a classroom just like this with me yapping in the front of it, uh, took good notes and went and started this wonderful company, Bunchball, that started building business games. Here's a, uh, a, an add-in that they built for the Salesforce platform that gave points and recognition and ribbons and badges, but put it right on the Salesforce uh, interface. Not so complicated. I mean, there's some connection and some enterprise uh, connectivity that's, uh, that's an issue, but people liked it. People did their work differently, a little bit more engaged. I mean, they've got lots of wonderful me metrics for this. Um, I, uh, Microsoft built a, several internal games. This one is for language translation in the new Windows product that they were building. Huge issue, 60-something languages that have to be done. Why not crowdsource this internally as a game and reward people for doing their translation, whatever language they own or know, uh, and almost all the languages represented somewhere at Microsoft, and we'll give them points and ribbons and recognition, we'll have leaderboard, uh, and we'll get uh, get things done better. They got a product that had better language translation. It was, translation. It was shipped faster than it would have been otherwise. People had fun. What's wrong with that? That can't be bad. Even places like Target, so this is really reduction now, we're getting the sauce really reduced here, was experimenting with terminals at the checkout counters that rewarded points, and in this, this is it's not a great game, but this is a game, but it rewarded points, uh, scores, to check out people based on how fast they were able to run a particular product through the scanner. And it took a lot longer to get the sweater for the little kid through the scanner than it did the carton of eggs, and so they, they knew how long that, that should take, and they, they could war, reward a green or red. And this wasn't 
used to figure out whether you were going to make another 20 cents per hour, but it was used any way the employees wanted to, to talk about it. Hey, you know, uh, trash talk, I bet you we can get a better score than you guys down there, or the, the earlier shift, or something. So, but they were expo experimenting with the reduction of these games. So I thought that was all really uh, a pretty interesting introduction. This. And th so at the same time, people really got excited about the business part of this, I think, because we didn't have to build World of Warcraft. We could move a needle that people valued. We could change behavior. So all these books, you know, just started flying <laughs> into Amazon. And some of them are really good. And it's how to do it. And they're written by game designers, uh, people that own business case for different uh, industries. Uh, and these are not, I, I, there may be one or two learning books in here, I'm not sure. But uh, th this is about work. It's not learning how to make money for stockholders once you get to your actual job. It's actually doing your actual job while you're in the game, while you're making money for stockholders. So these people are really interested in that. Lots of uh, people start talking about the books. I mean, this is how many books there were. <laughs> And this, this guy, Chris Dugan, for, uh, uh, involved in uh, some of the, the startups around that time, a major business dude uh, writing uh, business gamification. That word is really starting to be used now. There are conferences in gamification. You can go to the Gamification Summit. Most of it's about work. Uh, some of it's, a, and websites and how to, to uh, uh, it initially started, you know, this conference was, uh, when it started maybe five years ago, I'm not quite certain of that, but uh, mostly interested in helping people use game thinking on websites that were uh, advertising films, you know, getting people together, using, using it as an advertising, a consumer base, or, or a, uh, a large retail store that wanted to collect people in a forum that knew how to lay the tile that they were selling. So if we could gamify our website, we could encourage people to come back. And Keith is the expert tile layer in the game, and he's got badges and points and ranks and levels and avatar gear and whatnot to show for that. So that's where it started, but then it moved quickly. Those budgets weren't as huge as the budgets for people that were actually designing work. How is it that you sell insurance? or a piece of software? How is it that you organize HR or compliance in a complex organization? So a lot of people doing that. And you know, this, this uh, uh, professor, uh, Kevin Warbach at Penn, Wharton School of Business, offering a MOOC in game, gamification. I thought that was a big, big step. So you know, tens of thousands of people signing up. Goodness knows how many of them actually hung in there, but it's good content. It's a good course. Um, Bing Gordon, the founder, co-founder of Electronic Arts, is talking about gamification and saying that. That's a pretty strong statement. I'm not sure I actually believe it, but um, this was, there was a lot of buzz and a lot of interest in bringing the same sensibilities others in this uh, seminar series have talked about into the domain of work. Companies, venture, betting, on gamification in work. This is even a year too old here. But I have no idea what the total investment is in, in gamification, but uh, you heard it here first. It's got to be at least 100 million. I can kind of count that up from the news articles I've read about this, the, the companies on this, on this slide. So lots and lots of interest and, and serious interest, people putting out serious money and trying to figure out who's building the platform, who's actually building the media, who's doing uh, more service-oriented custom work, and who's doing stuff that could be applied anywhere, and a lot of different conversations here. And this is obviously still playing out. But you have to read this, Dilbert, because <laughs> this is also a big part of the history uh, and a big part of the context for talking about doing this today. This, this wasn't just a Dilbert take on this. this, this got to be, there got to be a little bit of a pushback, which still kind of exists, that 
um, you know, just pinning ribbons on people virtually and digitally isn't you know, much different than how it might feel in real life and it doesn't feel all that great. And um, this is, you know, there were people writing uh, one of the most well-cited uh, articles is uh, gamification is bullshit. Bogast, Ian Bogast, look it up. It's, and it's some interesting comments about how business trends are co-opted. Uh, check the box, yes, I'm involved in, in whatever Deloitte, Accenture, IBM says is the coolest thing to be involved in right now. And that gamification kind of felt like that a little bit. And there still is a little bit of tension there. So all those companies, a lot of those companies, Bunchball, Badgeville, uh, companies that are substantial, tens and tens of people spending real money and with lots of clients, lots and lots of clients who have a pain point. You know, work often sucks <laughs> and we can't get people engaged in work in, in the way we'd like to. And we think that's one of the biggest reasons why people are not giving their all and we're not, we're not growing as a company as we should. So there was a lot of pain. There was a lot, some controversy that's happening here. So in this history, and I'm going to get to, I'm going to show you a couple things that we're working on now that, you know, that kind of come from this history, but I think the history is important uh, to look at. Is there, the question actually now is, is there something in between the media that got us excited in the first place, the Warcraft type media that takes millions of dollars to produce, lots of people playing at once, um, a very complex collaboration, and something that's a little simpler. You know, we're going to um, uh, link our game platform to your uh, uh, company website, and we're going to add a column you know, over here that has uh, progress bars, badges, uh, uh, team scores, and, and whatnot. Is there something in between here? And so one of the things that I think is uh, interesting to think about now as examples of what's being done is something in between. And there is something in between. And it was for, I'm getting down to, to the group that I uh, have worked with. Um, there are a lot of folks that are working on this. My uh, co-author on that book, Total Engagement, Leighton Reed, uh, has been very uh, uh, much involved in this and has been a, a great partner in this as an entrepreneur. Um, and someone with great business, business experience. And a lot of students, um, Nick Yi, who was uh, uh, here a couple weeks ago, one of the people that we were watching play Star Wars Galaxies and learned a lot from. But there's a genre of games that's very popular, that's kind of in between, that, that is, comes out more, it's a little bit more of this Farmville sensibility in terms of media richness but it's also strategic simulations of stuff that's hard to do, like run a railroad, railroad tycoon. And if you, the game's called blank tycoon, whatever it is. I mean, there are a thousand of them. Roller coaster tycoon, grocery store tycoon. And it, they are resource management games that simulate something in real life with media that's generally pretty simple. I mean, this, this is, nice stuff, but it's a lot easier, you can imagine, than constructing a three-dimensional virtual environment. But very interesting strategically, and also easy, relatively easy, to imagine how you might link the play to the real world, which is maybe one of the most important things to try to do. That it, th this is, remember, the idea here is not to build a game that you go into the back room, that's the learning room over there, go into that room, learn, and learn in a better way than you might have otherwise, because you're engaged. And then come on out here, and this is where the real work gets done. But could you make, could you actually run a real railroad in Railroad Tycoon if you hooked up all the software stuff to the real world stuff? And that was kind of the, what, we were, what we were all kind of thinking about and hoping for, to actually change the nature of work not just the preparation for work. Imagine we were all in a brainstorming session over the course of a week or a month and we came up with the idea of movies. Movies are gonna be huge. <laughs> movies are gonna be cool. Here's all the equipment you need, here's what it needs to look like, here are the different roles that you have to take. Now, let's prove that business case. So what do we do? We make a movie. <laughs> what are the chances we make a movie that doesn't suck? <laughs> it, about, there are about 
one in six or seven that we make a great movie. And that's if we've got $100 million to spend. Uh, and if we don't have uh, that much to spend, then you know, we, we have a chance of really making a piece of media that's not a fair representation. So this is a tough case to prove because the actual products needed to do that are, um, are part of this hit business issue. So when you make media, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna work or not. You know, you're gonna get an investment in your company or not. Not because you read a book that games are entertaining, but you've got a particular game title that's got the coolest little character or the coolest little drawings or places or the most interesting things to do, and that's gonna win. So, you know, if I were, if I was investing in a proof of concept here, I mean, here, here's, I'm going to show you a game that we um, built for uh, uh, Best Buy. And it's, it's one of a million games that we could have built for <laughs> Best Buy. It's got a particular look and feel. It's got characters that are this way. We didn't quite spend, we don't have a 3D environment. We've got kind of a 2D and a half, 2 and a half D environment. So um, here's, here's, here's an example. I'm gonna show you three different examples. So here's an example. Um, this, th we were working on this for two, in two different uh, contexts. One was sales training. So these are Best Buy folks, general, I mean, these are not people that are connected to enterprise systems and have an email address. I mean, they may have a Best Buy email address, but it's all kind of go to the back of the room, you know, work it out, figure out how, it, how it's done. So our idea was a railroad tycoon. Uh, version. So this is only one idea. There could have been others. You'd ha probably have better ones. Uh, but let's do a railroad tycoon, really simple graphics. And here's the deal. Run your own damn Best Buy store. That's how you learn how to be a salesperson in a Best Buy store. Or that's how you learn how to, uh, may, the best way to, to learn how to work in the call center that represents the company. Run your own store. So you come into this store. This is all running off a of server right now. Uh, first of all, you got to get points in the game uh, to buy different departments because when you open up departments, you get to have more inventory that you purchase in the game. So you get a virtual currency in the game and I can buy stuff in the game. By the way, while I'm doing that, I'm learning the different margins on different pieces of uh, uh, inventory that are sold in the store. So I'm learning a lot about the store. I'm learning, I may be reinf uh, reinforced for making sure the stock is, uh, is high in uh, paper because we've got a printer sale. Uh, you know, all these things that you're learning how to do. So that's one thing you're doing. You're having a little bit of fun. You've got an avatar in the game that's gonna, we're gonna simulate actually walking up to customers. And you know, this, is, this seems like a cheesy thing. It was one of the you know, most interesting things in the game. You can you go in the game and you can customize your own avatar in a number of different dimensions. You can get a button that looks like that avatar and wear it. Uh, it may have uh, indication of a particular rank and you can, you know, walk up to Keith and say, well, your button doesn't look, you know, quite as nice as mine does because I'm a little farther in the game or whatever it is. There's a lot of fun trash talking that happens with respect to teams, but you've got stuff to do. You've, you hire people. So you not only have to have the right inventory, you've got to have the right number of people on the floor. It usually means maybe less than you'd like to have uh, to make some money for this store. And this is all being calculated in the store, you're seeing metrics of, of money and currency, and I, I'm learning how to, uh, I'm learning now how to approach customers to sell different kinds of products. I've got a wizard up in the upper left who uh, gave me, gives, gives uh, advice periodically. Uh, I, I can click on a customer and I can be asked, do I want to approach that guy? Uh, who's standing there uh, very cautiously, only cautiously, or just go right directly toward him. This is a lesson that the retail, retailers thought was important. So we're gonna approach him directly. We're gonna run over there. Uh, and the wizard's gonna tell me something about uh, whether or not that was a good way to do that. So I'm still in learning mode now. But maybe the lesson of the day is we'd really like to sell some service contracts on the phones because that's where we make all our money. <laughs> you know, the phones are pretty much free. So, we, so let me teach you about that. You know, it's not approaching a customer, let's, and we're gonna teach you about that. And of course, we've never got, we haven't gotten this far yet, but the point of sale system 
is tabulating whether Byron sold how many service contracts or the percentage of service contracts on fo uh, phones that I've sold. It's tabulating that moment by moment and the potential to feed that right back into the game right at the moment it's happening is tremendous. So now you don't have to say we need to learn how to sell and that will eventually somehow turn into revenue for the company. You can say here was a lesson we were teaching and look at this store. Look at Frank in this store. He started out you know, at 10% service contracts and finished up at 47% service contracts. Now, uh, forget for a second where you think that was a good thing to take advantage of Frank uh, with an entertainment vehicle here yet, but it is pretty interesting in terms of the feedback possibilities and the connection between virtual and real. I think that's maybe one of the most interesting parts of this is what's happening in the real life. You might not need the World of Warcraft graphics because you're actually doing something in the real world. So one of the things that's interesting here is in a business sense, these are business games, how much of this is repeatable? It doesn't look terribly repeatable because you got all these little Best Buy things in here and whatnot. But maybe you could reskin that and maybe for maybe you know, I don't 80%, 90% of the cost of doing the next one is already already in here. So that's the, so the skinning is really important. So the, the 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 hope I think for all those companies that I showed you is that it's a platform, it's repeatable business, it's not a service thing. That's we're not an ad agency. We're not making a new piece of media for a new big giant thing for everybody that comes along. Let me mention a, a couple things. That we're, we're gonna we we quit it. Five, or, or at one rather. Okay, good. So we had 12 more minutes. One thing I want to mention that's really important is that in this world right here, stuff happens. Our stuff happens in the business case. So, you know, there was just a snowstorm in, the, in Minneapolis, and we've got to teach people this instead of that. Uh, so uh, we've got to go back to these guys, and we've got to have them redraw, redo the game, and Ah, uh, geez, that's going to be bad. And you know, only, only they got to talk to the graphic designers and the developers and whatnot. No, is the goal here? N none of that. That there is a wizard behind the curtain that can pull levers and change this game. And that's what this this notion of the office of the game is: is to have a way, just like Zynga, just like people that are making these web-based games can change what the reinforcement structure is for purchasing the red truck versus the green truck. You know, well, the green truck's not doing well. Get it out of there. Get it out of here today. Don't go back to the, find a way to put a number in a box and have the game change right then. So that's really important. So this, this actually was a, uh, uh, a console that was made for the game version that was used in a um, call center. So, Believe it or not, people are talking on the phone, they've got the interface that they use for resolving their calls, and they're playing this game at the same time. And the game is reinforcing different aspects of the call. And here's how it's doing right here. So imagine this is joysticks right here. So if you work in a call center, you've got to go fast, you've got to have a great conversation, and you've got to gather data while you're doing it. All that are competitive. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go fast and have the person like me. Well, you, you got to go fast in December, around Christmas. You don't have to go fast in June, okay? So you can take these little, uh, these little uh, pieces here and move them around to emphasize different reinforcement in the game. So if you're working, if this is a call center version, if you're working at, at a call center, you give more points or change the nature, nature of the reinforcement for going fast. Because that's what we need to do today. Or our call volume is low. Change it now. Uh, so having that ability to go into these games and, and provide that kind of uh, uh, change quickly is, is important. This was just, I, I, we don't have time to look at a whole lot of numbers, but um, th this is the average uh, mean talk time in, in calls of two groups in a call center that were being, being reinforced differently for speed. Not told to go fast or slow just found out that if you went fast, because it's easy to measure, you got more points for doing the kinds of things that we want you to do, or you got more recognition. So it, it works, and especially if it's tied, if it's closely linked with uh, 
with what, what's going on in the actual work. Okay, let me just show you quickly a, a, a couple others. We, we've got, uh, oh, we have 10, 12 more minutes here. But please, feel free to ask questions as we go and we'll make the Q&A part built in here. Okay, so moving a little bit out of the business context but staying in the behavior change uh, mode here, this was a game that we developed um, uh, with funding from the Department of Energy. It was part of a large uh, uh, interdisciplinary grant to Stanford that had about 12 faculty that were involved in using different ways to create behavior change in the area of energy uh, efficiency. So our idea, I mean, we were doing a lot of different things, some hardware, some software, and some more community intervention. Energy is boring. My monthly bill is terribly boring. You know, this X, Y coordinates of spending over time, I don't care. Um, that it's not enough money really to, to matter. It's just the engagement is very low. But if we could change 1% of your behavior, you know, across a lot, enough people, it would be a very significant thing in terms of, the, of, of uh, climate change and, and carbon, uh, uh, et cetera. So we developed a game that used data. It's, the, the similarity here is stuff going on in the real world gets to be part of the game. Uh, this is the first kind of non-game uh, or a piece of the, uh, not the actual uh, game here, but I want to show you that we're connecting this game that you play on the web to stuff going on in the real world. So every home, almost every home now in the PG&E uh, region has a smart meter in the home that is collecting information in real time about energy use in the house. And you know, the worst case is we've got that about every hour or maybe every 15 minutes. Best case is we've got some uh, uh, data miners who can actually come up with an algorithm to differentiate turning off a light versus set it, resetting the thermostat of a refrigerator. So cool stuff, good stuff that's useful in terms of energy. And I can see what's happening. I don't have to wait for a monthly piece of paper. I can actually go into this game and I can, I can see what's happening. And I get re rewarded in the game, uh, you know, I, this Farmville style, that's why I put that up at the beginning here. I get houses with more or less uh, solar panels or I get a windmill in my house. My team is doing better. My church choir against your church choir, we're, we're knocking the socks off you. Uh, in terms of real behavior in the real world, this is not uh, just learning what happens here, but it's playing this game. This is the actual game here. Uh, that where you're chasing, you, uh, these characters are entering this house and you are chasing, um, uh, you as a user, player, are chasing these characters around the house, having to turn on and off lights for them, having to help them do what they want to do, like get into the refrigerator or turn a light on or operate an appliance or something. Turning on and off those appliances, they are using energy in a real sense. So this is a, a, a stealing from a di little bit different uh, uh, genre of games, not so much uh, uh, Railroad Tycoon as Diner Dash. Uh, I think I've seen, see about half the room here nods up and down. You're chasing waitresses and waiters around, uh, 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 trying to help them serve meals, and eventually you fail. That's what happens here also. But whether or not you fail, is related to what, how quickly and what kinds of spiffs and uh, things you can use in the game is related to actual energy use in your house. So there's a lot to say about that and I'll, that I'll kind of skip over, but it's virtual world and real world connected. And you can actually go play this game. It's being uh, uh, used right now. You go to freeenergygame.com. I don't think I put this on here. But you can only play, and the reason I'm not playing it for you right now, is if you're connected to a PG&E smart meter. So you can start playing the game, you can try it out. Um, and it's, um, it was built by a great uh, game company in New York um, with, with us here as part of that uh, grant project. Connect the real world and the virtual world, use the entertainment features of the game, create a media experience, you know, something like this that's a little bit in between World of Warcraft and just a, a badge of ribbon. But you've got other pages in here that, I, that have your ribbons. You get virtual currencies in the game. You can use to uh, um, plant a tree in Brazil or get a t-shirt or do things that, that maybe a company might sponsor. So a lot of interesting uh, revenue parts there. 
So we, we did a couple experiments with this that's really kind of fun. Uh, th this one is, ah, it's almost a silly experiment, but it was, uh, we, we, did, we t tested the game in, in, the net, in the real world in a field setting. I'll show you that in a second. But this was in a lab, just up in our building in the communication department. Invite people in, have them play that game for 20 minutes, chasing mom and dad and the kids around the house, turning on and off the lights. And one of the things you notice is, you know, people come out of there and say, oh, it just reminds me of my dad always trying to tell me to turn the lights off when I left the room. And so you play that game for 20 minutes, or you watch an unrelated video, and then kind of toward the end of that play period, the experimenter comes in to the door and says, you know, I've got to, actually, I've got to take off, and would you just um, close the door and you're free to go when, when your time is done playing the game, when you fill out the questionnaire. So a, a very kind of ambiguous instruction about your exit from that room and here are all the things that are in that room and that are on while you're in playing the game. There's a computer, a desk lamp, floor lamp, light switch, monitor, speakers, all that. So you can either leave it all on and close the door and run away, or you can go and turn that stuff off. And if you played the game for 20 minutes before you filled out this questionnaire uh, that was unrelated, it was all about games, it wasn't about, and media, it wasn't about energy at all, no, no, no mention of that. You turned out more stuff, so something got through there. There's a feedback mechanism there that you know you get this this uh, uh, almost rote seeing this behavior got did well, this behavior did well, and you change your behavior. And the same thing happens. Uh, this was a, a trial we we just started or we and completed with 50 households in the area where we measured their energy use in kilowatt hours for a 30 day period here. This period which is yellow on my computer, is the period during which you're playing the game, and this is 30 days after. So while you're playing the game, energy use in the house goes down. And this is even if one person is playing the game, and because we're, we're measuring this kilowatts for a, an actual household. It goes away as soon as the media go, <laughs> goes away, but it's, a, it's you know, two, three, four, four percent uh, drop in the actual uh, energy usage, which, in, you know, in terms of psychological experiments is not huge, but in terms of the value of that change in the real world, is, is, it's really pretty significant. Um, the, other, the other game, so this is, a, I, I think, an interesting game, and I'll mention it just why I think this. It's, it looks kind of similar to the um, Best Buy game, but this is a game being played by retail clerks at a grocery store, at a bunch of grocery stores. It's called Game Sharing. Oh, I've got to actually log into this one. Let's see if I pick a good person to be. How about Byron? So these are people that are stocking shelves at a checkout counter, cleaning floors, cutting meat and fish. And it's a, it's a, a similar um, context to the Best Buy game where the training challenges are, I mean, this is, uh, you know, people come into the store, they raise their hand. Uh, so instead of going to Whole Foods University, you get asked a question, you answer the question, you get reinforced for that. Um, um, oh, I actually got that one right. I get reinforcement, good job. I, there are things that I can do in the real, real world that um, could be tied back into the game, like I, I can agree to take on a challenge, to talk to a customer about X or Y, or learn about something. Um, that's all in there. The same kind of control panel is in there. <coughs> the company actually has a method of um, sharing revenue with hourly employees that is uh, based on their knowledge of how expensive it is to have an employee and how much they make selling different products. So you can, you know, you've got the same inventory that, that's going on here. One of the, the reason I show this one, it's a little, little bit different. So you've got other things you can do in this. This is, this is played in two ways. One is it's played in the back of the house on a fairly large touchscreen computer when you clock in and clock out. Two minutes, three minutes. Actually, at 
some number of minutes, you start losing points because you need to get out into the floor. Uh, but while you're in there, you're learning stuff that will help the company. And so that, that's a pretty important part of that. But you're all, the, the other interesting part of this is mostly and eventually this game will be played on a mobile phone. So right now, the, this game can also be activated on an iOS device that you can play most of that game while you're walking around, while you're actually out on the floor cleaning stuff, learning how to cut meat, uh, uh, sharpen the knives, etc. So the, the mobile aspect of this is really interesting <coughs> and is a whole new area where games can really work well. And I think there's some educational implications of this as well. We're, we're thinking a lot about the undesked, the people that don't have a laptop computer or are not hooked up to an enterprise computing system. That's tens and tens of millions of people that work in retail, hospitality, grocery stores, uh, baggage handling, that, that still need to be engaged with company policies and, and goals and HR issues and learning and whatnot. So I, I mentioned that as a, um, and, and what's hot in these games? This is really hot. <laughs> thinking about providing data to people in charge about the influence of what you've built for uh, the, the, the people to play. So this is how many people are, th this is an extensive back-end uh, uh, visibility into the database of who's playing, who's learning, um, how they doing, how are the different, these are different stores in, in the region, how are they doing against each other, uh, providing information as to what, uh, uh, about, about analytics. And this is one of the things I said, this is my last slide, but th this is the, uh, one of the things I said was, was uh, a major current issue is moving a specific needle is really, really important. You know, we've got this, it, it, we're, I think we're done with this general notion that entertainment value uh, brought to serious contexts can really uh, have an influence. We've got all these different contexts in which that can be used, but what is the specific needle that you're moving and the analytics around that is very important. I've already mentioned uh, this notion of a hit business. Games are a hit business here, so there's not a way, it's not like building a software algorithm that either works or doesn't and, and the different versions of it are, you know, they're, they're not different flavors, they're actually just totally different algorithms. One of the things that, that we're interested in, so you, you, when you look at the books written about games, is there's a long list of stuff you can use from these games. Points, leaderboards, ribbons, badges are the things that we've looked at the most, but the, the harder things are perhaps the most value. Building in a story. What's your company's story? What are they trying to do? And make the game about that story. Uh, finding a way to be represented in the game. Playing teams. I mean, don't make me compete with Keith. Make my team compete with his team. And it seems to, that it seems to work a little bit better. Uh, and I, I mentioned this, the, 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 this uh, the use of mobile games is not only critically important if you're building games for entertainment right now, but I think it'll be eventually important in learning and, and, uh, and, and in business games. People move around while they work, they move around while they're at school. And the other thing, this notion of BYOD here, bring your own device. Everybody in this room, and even if we were all hourly, employed hourly at Whole Foods markets, has a supercomputer in their pocket that they know how to use, they really like, they've already paid for, uh, they keep it up to date, they re you know, refresh the software, Find a way that that can actually be used in these systems without having to purchase media, new media that, uh, you know, force a school system to, to, to pay for uh, new tablets for the entire school. So this notion of bring your own device, I think, is important also. So those are kind of current events. I'm happy to answer any more questions, but we're right at UNO. Uno.